Hello. Hello. Thanks for joining us today on another Wednesday chat. I'm doing the Minor Prophets and I'm on Isaiah, Amos today. Sorry about that. I'm on Amos. And uh, let me read a quote from Eugene Peterson. More people are exploited and abused in the cause of religion than in any other way. Sex, money, and power all take a backseat to religion as a source of evil. Religion is the most dangerous energy source known to humankind. The moment a person or government or religion or organization is convinced that God is either ordering or sanctioning a cause or project, anything goes. The history worldwide of religion-fueled hate, killing, and oppression is staggering. The biblical prophets are in the front line of those doing something about it. The biblical prophets continue to be the most powerful and effective voices ever heard on this earth for keeping religion honest, humble, and compassionate. Prophets sniff out injustice, especially injustice that is dressed up in religious garb. They sniff it out a mile away. Prophets see through hypocrisy, especially hypocrisy that assumes a religious pose. Prophets are not impressed by position or power or authority. They aren't taken in by numbers, size, or appearances of success. They pay attention to what men and women say about God or do for God. They listen to God and rigorously test all human language in action against what they hear. Among those prophets, Amos Towers, as a defender of the downtrodden poor and accuser of the powerful rich who use God's name to legitimize their sin. None of us can be trusted in this business. If we pray and worship God and associate with others who likewise pray and worship God, we absolutely must keep company with these biblical prophets. We are required to submit all our words and acts to their passionate scrutiny to prevent the perversion of our religion into something self-serving. A spiritual life that doesn't give a large place to the prophet articulated justice will always end up making us worse instead of better separating us from God's ways instead of drawing us into them. It's a good summary of the book of Amos. He was a businessman who owned cattle and sheep and also fig trees. He was called a fig piercer from Tekoa, which was a small town about 12 miles south of Jerusalem in, in the south in Judah. His name means load or burden. He went from being a rancher to a prophet. He carried a burden or load for the Lord, for his people. While he was from Judah in the south, he prophesied in Israel in the north at Bethel, which was the residence of the king and the center of idolatry. His was a difficult ministry because no one wanted to hear his message. He preached one year and then went home to write his book. There's no doubt when he prophesied, it was during the reigns of Uzziah in the south and Jeroboam the second in the north. He preached around 760 BC, which would make him a contemporary of Jonah. He preached during a time of prosperity. Israel controlled the ancient trade routes. A new class of wealthy merchants arose who exploited the poor. It was a quiet time politically. Syria was weak, and Assyria hadn't yet risen to prominence. The borders of Israel had expanded to nearly the same as during the reigns of David and Solomon. Baal worship was flourishing. His message was that religion and ethics go hand in hand. You must live out your faith. James in the New Testament would be very similar, to be doers of the word, not just hearers only. Amos says, if there's no justice, then judgment will come. He was shocked at the societal and religious corruption he witnessed. His key word of his book is justice, mispot, harmony with a standard of right and wrong. Let me read one, chapter one, verse two. And he said, the Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem. The pastors of the shepherds mourn and the top of Carmel withers. He's saying there, God's voice is heard all over Israel from the farthest points of the south to the north. Amos then in his book delivers eight judgment speeches. Seven neighbors in Israel are the recipients. 
It, his is a very stylized writing. He has pretty much the same pattern throughout the book. Thus says the Lord. That's called the messenger formula. Then he says, for three transgressions of blank and for four. That's called the numerical formula. For you've sinned enough plus one. Because, that's the accusation, therefore I will send fire or whatever the judgment is. That's the announcement of judgment. I will also, is the elaboration of judgment. And then, thus says the Lord, the messenger formula. Six neighbors were judged for violations of human rights, for cruelty and slave trade. The seventh, Judah's violation is God's law has not been kept. And Israel's violation was both societal and religious crimes. They were engaged in slave trade, materialism, and not keeping the law. The people in the north, the king in Bethel, was keeping the, his people from going down to Jerusalem and worshiping in the temple. 2, 6 through 8. Thus says the Lord, For three transgressions of Israel and for four, I will not revoke the punishment because they sell the righteous for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. Those who trample the head of the poor into the dust of the earth and turn aside the way of the afflicted, a man and his father go in to the same girl so that my holy name is profaned. They lay themselves down beside every altar on garments taken in pledge and in the house of their God they drink the wine of those who have been fined. And six, four through six. Woe to those who lie on beds of ivory and stretch themselves out on their couches and eat lambs from the flock and calves from the midst of the stall, who sing idle songs to the sound of the harp, and like David invent for themselves instruments of music, who drink wine in bowls and anoint themselves with the finest oils, but are not grieved over the ruin of Joseph. Our checkbook says a lot about us, doesn't it? Right. Amos 4, 1 and verse 12. Hear this word, you cows of Bashan, who are on the mountain of Samaria, who oppress the poor, who crush the needy, who say to your husbands, bring that we may drink. Therefore, thus I will do to you, O Israel, because I will do this to you. Prepare to meet your God, O Israel. So Amos was a cattle breeder, and in another translation, he, he calls these women cows and says, prepare to meet your God. God wants lives of his people to be marked by justice. In Amos 5, 14 to 15, and verse 24, seek good and not evil, that you may live. And so the Lord, the God of hosts, will be with you, as you have said, hate evil and love good, and establish justice in the gate. It may be that the Lord, the God of hosts, will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. But let justice roll down like waters, and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. I think those passages that I've read today give you <coughs> an understanding of what the book is about. <coughs> the last three chapters, 7 through 9, <coughs> list five visions... <coughs> And the first three are locusts, fire, and a plumb line. In 7, 10 to 17, the prophet is doing battle with Amaziah, who said he was, was not a true prophet because his words are negative and against Israel. Go back to your town and prophesy. He says, no one wants to hear your word of judgment. The fourth vision is a summer basket of fruit. They're ripe for judgment. And the fifth vision, an earthquake. The last chapter provides a word of hope, the promise of restoration. In chapter 9, verses 11 to 15, you can look that up. I encourage you to read that. The terminology is agricultural terms. The fertility cycle will be sped up. In the book of Amos, God is the creator over all. He's the God of all the nations, and he's the God of justice for the poor.
that beginning quote about religion. Um, maybe we'll find something here about that. How do we know our search of the scriptures has yielded true belief, that we have not actually remained in unbelief? I'm really thankful for Galatians 4, 6 that shows a testimony that it's been true belief. Because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts crying, Abba, Father. So this comes from Father and then back to Father. And it reveals it isn't just a conviction we have from Scripture, but it's true that he's sent this cry into our hearts. You know, I would maybe be the first to cringe realizing that years of reading the Scripture can't prove I have a proper belief. The Spirit inside doesn't lie and validates the Father has been truly believed upon to evoke this daddy closeness. How do we know we are of the truth but by the Spirit he's given? Romans 8, 9. But you are not of the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be, the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now if any man has not the Spirit, he is none of his. 1 John 4, 13, whoever keeps his commandments remains in God and God in him. By this we know he remains in us by the spirit he has given us. John 14, 17, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him because he lives with you and will be in you. So this um, Hebrews three twelve reads even more intensely with this take care brothers lest there be in any any of you an evil unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living god so outwardly we could look quite active religiously but unbelief or a wrong belief may be causing us to depart from the living god so sad and futile when unintentionally wrong beliefs would creep in as right belief has a lot of opportunities to get corrupted, I think we all know. But Jesus said we ourselves may be the worst source, the main source, projecting upon the word from our own inside ill temperament. Jesus says that's where real defilement comes. So the living relationship comes from a right belief where we say, Abba, Father, and we're not departing means that all that's been digested of scripture has caused us actually to turn to him. Sh lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so that I should heal them. Wow, what a healing, spiritually, mentally, physically. Unbelief has always been such an interesting word. You have the difference between paitha, to be convinced and persuaded, and here it would mean the truth, or adding the A means the lack of belief or right belief to be convinced or persuaded. So think of this as I read Hebrews 4, 6. Since therefore it remains for some to enter it, those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience slash unbelief. 4, 11. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Jesus didn't do many miracles because of their unbelief in Nazareth. In unbelief, they withheld from themselves divine power and promises. So we understand the cry of the father of the de demonized. I believe, help thou my unbelief. So proper convincing of his goodness and that he even loves you may be the main difference between belief and unbelief. Unbelief departs from the living God. Unbelief and disobedience are almost alike and interchangeable and often translated interchangeable, but we can almost see a progression. You got the Greek word um, unbelief 543 where it seems to progress to Greek number 571, disobedience, faithlessness, unpersuadable, a state we're not able to be convinced. It now seems to become an identity. 
disbelieving as an unbeliever, heathen, infidel, being a child of disobedience. So unbelief, not believing on God and his character is huge. And part of that for many is some of us don't really believe God loves us. And this is a major dealing in life of wrong belief. But my righteous one will live by faith. And if he shrinks back, I will take no pleasure in him. Well, shrinking back sounds like departing from the living God. But it goes on. But we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but to those who have faith and are saved. So to not depart, we are turning to Abba Father lest we be healed. So I know I can't come to this right belief on my own. And there's a verse that really sums this up. We do not find the Father heart on our own. So mercy, mercy realize it, it realizes it must find us. No matter how well studied, mercy has to find us. Romans 11.32, For God has consigned all to disobedience slash unbelief that he may have mercy on us all. So with a wide paintbrush, he consigns, literally imprisons all of us in imprisonment to disobedience and unbelief. We're besieged, we're concluded, we're shut up all together. As 11.23 says, shut up unto the faith that should afterward be revealed. Galatians 3.22 but the scripture imprisoned everything under sin so that the promise of faith in Christ Jesus might be given to those who believe. So who has concluded this unbelief about us? Well, God has the right to with the sum of all his thoughts towards us. We heard in Psalms 139, whose thoughts are as the sands of the sea and certainly knows the truth about us. We can't claim he doesn't know our thoughts. And when he designates, consigns us as such, it is certainly true. We are hemmed in by him knowing us. Again, Psalms 139. The Father knows more than anyone where untruth about him lies in us, causing us to depart and not to believe in the Father's heart. So this imprisonment has a so that. All our thoughts have no other way of escape than to receive mercy. True belief in the Father then comes for the one who will receive mercy from the Father. Even today, who will be the most apt to receive mercy today? Religious or non-religious, we all take a humble knee. We're shut up unto our own unbelief, ignorance, disobedience, so we're meant for mercy for it to swirling around us. An army of now, of us who receive mercy. We're now called a people who have received mercy. It's our identity. So let's start belief here and learn the Father's heart. Who will most receive mercy? Well, Paul did. First Timothy 1.13, who was before a blasphemer, a persecutor, injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. He who is forgiven much loves much. Paul obtained mercy. It was done in unbelief, but he was granted and he obtained it. The right step to belief is how Jesus is directed to you, his heart to you right now. So Jesus could say to Jairus, don't be afraid. Just believe and she will be healed for his daughter. Mark 5, 34, daughter, your faith has made you whole. Go in peace. Be whole of your plague. Catch what this belief they had was. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, take my yoke upon you. Learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. Like previously in Hebrews 4, they couldn't find rest. Now we're learning his heart, and we find rest. So Jared Long a, from Ohio, a godly pastor church planner had two sons with all the hopes any new father would have for them. Yet one by one, they showed two different and devastating um, diagnoses. As father love was mirrored in the heavenly father, he sought, he sorrowed, he sought the word 
and the father wholeheartedly. And in that schooling, he learned and was taught the father's heart for the healing of his sons and what place father's heart had in that healing. The book he wrote, I still believe, is called God's Heart to Heal. He expressed the way we ask, is it God's will for my or your illness? Is way too cold. Again, Abba Father here. Rather, ask words that form us into the right belief about the Father's heart. Is it God's desire for you to be well? Is it his preference for you to be well? Is it his heart? for you to be well? And then conversely, is it his desire for you to be ill? His preference for you to be ill? His heart for you to be ill? Ask him personally so that not departing, you're doing a personal seeking and leaning upon Abba Father. So along with the huge factor of patiently waiting, he came up with six pillars, I would call them, of God's word and the gospel revealed to him and now what Jared leans on in the process of healing for his sons and the ministry that this is birthed in his ministry. So I'm putting a link in the comment section and it would be basically minute 23 to 30 on that or I'm just going to give you um, the, those six notes briefly. Creation was good and completed in the eyes of the creator to have created Adam and Eve with perfect health. Number two, even after the fall, he revealed himself with the name Jehovah Rapha, God, my healer. In the incarnation, this is number three, Jesus did not bring sickness to people, but he healed them. Four, he commissioned the same to the 12 and then to the 70 and then on to the church to continue the ministry of healing. Again, not bringing illness, but healing. Acts um, 2, um, number five, Pentecost. All covenant people were given the Holy Spirit and one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is healing, the gift of healing. And lastly, number six, the new creation, Revelation 22, where we behold I make all things new where all are healed. Again, lean. Abba, Father, where do we find ourselves? We certainly have defenses of our own experience in this. But what do we conclude alone about the Father's heart? Let's not be found unpersuadable. If I begin concluding and something softens and I come closer and lean on his heart, how will this th change things for me? I, I don't know. Only God knows this. Just lean. Do not depart from him being unpersuadable. Lean on the living God. Come near and learn of him and find rest for your souls. All we want to do is to lean on belief on God's heart as it truly is. David in 2 Samuel 7, 27 said, For you, O Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, have made this revelation to your servant, saying, I will build you a house. Therefore your servant has found courage to pray this prayer to you. Likewise, if we're getting to know his heart, it gives us courage to lean anew on the Father's heart. Again, as he said, lest they should turn and I would heal them. Let's pray. Lord, those of us who call ourselves Christians, who are religious and go to church, let us make sure not only that we believe rightly on you, who you are, what your heart is, but also we act it out in our daily lives. Help us to do that today. In Jesus' name, amen.